Welcome back to Module 3. Recall, we're in the middle of the study of the GNSS signals and getting a deeper feeling for them by employing the frequency domain. In the last snippet, we talked about frequency domain techniques more or less in the abstract. We tried to use examples that were relevant to satellite navigation, but now we'll really dive in and take a look at the amplitude spectra of GNSS signals. So, here it is. And I hope <clears throat> you're delighted by the appearance of sine x over x. Here it is here. Let me highlight it just for fun. And of course it goes on and on and on. Remember those side lobes just kept on going out. <clears throat> and notice that this is for the GPS L2 frequency. And uh, it has a rather broad sine x over x. And that's because, for many years, the only signal there was the military one, which had a bandwidth of 10 million chips per second. And so that translates into a bandwidth, a so-called null-to-null -null bandwidth, from this null to this null, of 20 megahertz. So that's the direct income inculcation of what we talked about last time, that items with higher rate will have broader spectrums because the higher rate corresponds to narrower pulses. So as we go up in the chipping rate, we're now talking about chips which are only 100 nanoseconds long, and the frequency domain is becoming correspondingly broader. At L1, the situation is more complicated. We have a military code there with the 10 mega chips per second, but we also have the civilian code with a chipping rate of only one mega chip per second. Because the chipping rate for the civil code is 10 times smaller, the null to null bandwidth is also 10 times smaller. <clears throat> it goes from 20 megahertz down to 2 megahertz. And those two spectra are superposed on top of each other because those two signals are transmitted, broadcast simultaneously by the satellites. Now, please know that in the newly launched GPS satellites, approximately the last 10 or so, the civilian code, or a civilian code, has also been broadcast on L2, so we can superpose on here. A sine x over x for your spectrum as well. So today, those two things look identical. <clears throat> With a picture like this, it's fun to talk about where has the utility from GPS come from? Well, the military receivers do use these broad spectrum here and here. The civilian receivers in your cell phone are entirely based on this signal here. So there's no appreciable use of PY code by civilians. And the marketplace, if you measure it by number of receivers built, is entirely based on that narrow spectrum at the high L1 frequency. It'll be interesting to see how that changes over time as the civilian signals become available at L2 and also at a lower frequency called L5. We'll come back to that later on. One of the advantages of frequency domain analysis is that you can measure it directly with instruments that we have in the laboratory. These things are called spectrum analyzers, vector analyzers, uh, vector analyzers, and so forth. And we have attached one of those to a satellite dish here at Stanford. And take a look, please, because once again, sine x over x appears. 
It's a little bit more subtle in the data. The military code appears here. So here's its sine x over x. Notice that there's another lobe that's starting here, but the filters in the antenna and the receiving equipment truncate those lobes that are further out. In contrast, the CA code, the civilian code, sits here right in the middle, and you can see its lobes coming down, superimposed on top of the main lobe of the PY code. So, this is one of the satisfying things about frequency domain analysis. Not only is it useful for theory, but it's also something that you can measure directly. So, let's talk about an extremely powerful application of for, uh, frequency domain uh, analysis to satellite navigation. Consider these two sketches of the GNSS signal in the frequency domain. I'll just add the label over here to the right to make it plain. And this is at the receiver antenna. And here we are, let's say, at FL1. And here we are at FL1 minus 1 megahertz. And here we are at FL1 plus 1 megahertz. And here's the beautiful sine x over x main lobe, and here's the first side lobe. In addition, we're suffering some radio frequency interference. So some signal with a narrow bandwidth is also arriving at our antenna, and that's what we show here in the middle. I show it as a generic blob because it may not be sine x over x, it may be just a sine wave, in which case it would be very, very narrow in the frequency domain, or something else that we're not aware of. Now, that's problematic for any radio system if you have additional radio signals arriving and potentially interfering with the measurements you want to make, in this case of pseudorange. But the rece receiver, if you recall, does correlation. So it takes that incoming CA code, and please recall from our early snippets, and tries to align it with a replica CA code in the receiver. So this I'm going to call post-correlation. And the neat thing is that when we multiply by that replica, once we get it aligned, all the variation in the received signal due to the code disappears. Because we have plus one times plus one is equal to plus one. Plus one, I'm oh, sorry, minus one times minus one is also equal to plus one. And we assume that replica is aligned with received, so there are no or few cases of plus one aligned with minus one. That means that the spectrum of the desired signal collapses. It's no longer set by the chipping rate of the code. It's set by the bit rate of the navigation data, which is the only thing that's still modulating the carrier. Recall that the code chipping rate is one million chips per second, and the navigation data is only 50 bits per second. So what happens is that this signal goes from having this broad or spread spectrum and it collapses to this narrow bandwidth which has a chip to uh, sorry null to null bandwidth of only 100 hertz because that would be twice the bit rate of 50 bits per second so that's good. It's interesting, isn't it, that that correlation operation has such a marked effect on the frequency description of the signal that we desire. But it does, and in fact, that despreading that you see there really gives rise to the name spread spectrum. We hope for, seek for, count on the correlation operation to collapse, to despread the signal spectrum. 
One of the reasons we love this is because what correlation does to the incoming RFI. Let's say that the incoming RFI, this undesired signal, is just a sine wave. But it too gets multiplied by the replica code. And we know well what happens when we take a sine wave and we multiply it by the replica code. Its bandwidth spreads to this very broad spectrum. So the CA code, the desired signal, goes from broad spectrum to narrow. The undesired signal, the RFI, goes from narrow to broad. Correlation despreads what we want, and it spreads the interference, what we don't want. The neat thing about that is that in the receiver, we'll now filter this newly configured sum of desired and interference with a narrow band filter. And the narrow band filter will have a bandwidth approximately equal to this 100 hertz. So it will sit here like this. It will take out, it will capture all of the power in the signal we desire, and at the same time, it will attenuate, get rid of all of this power from the interference. That process is called processing gain, and the processing gain is the ratio of all the power that was originally in the RFI, also shown here spread under this entire sine x over x, divided by the interference power that remains after filtering, which is this tiny power here. So, I hope you've enjoyed that one example of the power of frequency domain analysis in satellite navigation. And I look forward to seeing you again next time.